So in the last video, we considered the EMF through this loop as I was moving it out of the field region. And it was just, I referred to this as a motional EMF. I'm now ready to generalize this into, turn this into Faraday's law, one of the fundamental laws of nature discovered by Michael Faraday. Um, and this, what we did last time is going to become an example of Faraday's law, but not, no longer the whole story. So what's the generalization? Well, um, first of all, let me remind you what we derived last time. We worked out the EMF around this loop, and I worked out the change in the magnetic flux through this loop, and we discovered that the EMF, th EMF around the loop was minus the time derivative of the magnetic flux through the loop. So if the magnetic flux through the loop is changing, which it was because I was pulling the loop out of the field region, then as the magnetic flux through the loop was decreasing, that induced an EMF around the loop. Um, so that's what we derived last video for this special case, for this example. The generalization is that this equation, this result, applies no matter what. It doesn't only apply in the case where the loop is moving. If my loop is standing still, but whoever it is out there that has these magnets that making this green magnetic field is changing the magnetic field. So suppose whoever is making the magnetic field, the loop's not moving anymore. But suppose whoever is changing the, uh, making the magnetic field is changing where the field is so that the field region is moving this way. So initially the field is everywhere to the left of this line. A little later it's everywhere to the left of this line, this line, this line. The field region is, is moving then that's going to change the flux through the loop. And Faraday's law says that in that case also, the EMF around this loop is minus d flux by d time. Now, we have no way of deriving that. We, you, what I just said, you cannot derive it from Coulomb's law. You can't derive it from Gauss's law. You can't derive it from Ampere's law. You can't derive it from B.O. Savar. Nothing we've done before will, will allow us to derive that. This is what makes this a new law of nature. Faraday got this came to this law by studying many, many experiments that he did, by observing, observing phenomena, and he reached the conclusion that this is a general result. Why is that? Well, the way we derived this previously was from the Lorentz force law, and it all had to do with charges moving. And now, there's no charges moving in what I just said. The wire is fixed. It's not moving. No charges moving. So if you try to derive use the derivation we did before, it wouldn't work at all. And yet, the result is still true. And so that's why I, Faraday's law is a new law of nature, not a consequence of what we had before. So historically, this is the right way to think of Faraday's law. It's a consequence of um, nothing that comes before. It's a law of nature unto itself, um, 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 arrived at, discovered by Michael Faraday based on his observations of many, many careful experiments that he did. However, um, to us today, it kind of feels natural because the way we think about this today, and I think that probably the way you're thinking about this as I'm explaining it is, well, it shouldn't really matter whether I'm moving the loop this way or I'm moving the field region that way. That shouldn't really matter, right? And Faraday's law, is in fact the statement that that doesn't matter. You get the same EMF, no matter whether you're moving the loop or you're moving the field, or for that matter, if you're changing the strength of the field, you get the same result also. The electromotive force around the loop is minus d by dt of the magnetic flux through the loop. No matter how you're making a change in the flux, you'll get an EMF. And the reason why this kind of feels natural to us is that this is at the core of Einstein's theory of relativity. And even though you haven't yet learned Einstein's theory of relativity, this basic feature of relativity that it shouldn't, the physics should be the same whether the loop is moving and the field is as it is, or the loop is fixed and the field is moving. This basic feature of Einstein's theory of relativity is baked into all of our thinking by now. So actually this generalization that I've just spent a few minutes stressing feels quite natural. But I want to stress that um, the historical order of things was not that at all. It is certainly absolutely not the case that Faraday figured this out from Einstein's theory of relativity. Faraday was in the 1820s. Einstein's theory of relativity is 1905. So even though to us, Faraday's law, this generalization feels natural because it sort of feels like relativity and we're sort of used to that even though we haven't learned it yet, um, 
the way it actually worked historically was that Faraday figured out his law from observing many experiments and many, many natural phenomena. And Faraday's law stood, stood as a law of nature. And then when Einstein came along in 1905, if you read Einstein's paper in 1905 in which he lays out for the very first time what we now call his theory of relativity, in that 1905 paper, the entire first paragraph is about Faraday's law. So what pushed Einstein to his discovery of relativity was, in fact, this very basic feature of Faraday's law that the EMF you get doesn't, it's the same if you, whether the loop is moving or the field is moving. Um, that was part of what motivated Einstein to discover relativity. But now, 110 years after relativity, 113 years after the discovery of relativity, we think about this in a more synthetic way. We, the way we think about this is that um, this feature of Faraday's law feels to us like a consequence of the principle of relativity which under, underlies Einstein's theory of relativity, which maybe you're all going to learn um, a little bit down the road. Okay, so. There you have it. That's Faraday's law. I want to write it a little bit more um, um, general and in, in, in generically, and I want to stress a second generalization. So um, how do I write this in a little bit more generic fashion? Um, I do so as follows. I'm going to write the EMF out. The EMF out, uh, the EMF is the integral around some closed contour C of E dot ds, because um, a force pushing a charge um, divided by, uh, divide by a q, that's, the, that's an electric field. Okay. And this is equal to minus d by dt of the magnetic flux through the loop. And the magnetic flux through the loop is a surface integral over some surface s of b dot dA. And now what are these loop C and this surface S? Well, in this example, the loop C was the wire, and the surface S was the interior of the rectangle. The generalization is that this loop C can be any contour. This is the contour C. And the surface area S is the surface whose boundary is the contour C, and in fact, it can be any surface whose boundary is this contour C. That's the generalization, and this is Faraday's law in, in its full glory. And I want to stress one aspect of this generalization. Really, I've, taken, I've done two generalizations um, in, in one. The first generalization is to say it doesn't matter who's moving. It doesn't matter whether the loop is moving or the field is changing. All that matters is that the flux through the loop is, is changing. It doesn't matter whether that, it does not matter whether the, this is changing in time because the loop is moving or because the magnetic field is something about the field is changing. That's generalization one. Generalization two is it doesn't matter if there's an aluminum wire on this rectangle. This is a statement about um, any arbitrary contour anywhere in the universe. For any contour in the universe, the integral of e dot ds around that contour is given by the change of the magnetic flux through that contour. That's Faraday's law. And if you put an aluminum wire here, this integral of e dot ds, this electromotive force, is going to push a current around that wire. But Faraday's law applies whether or not there's a loop of aluminum here. Faraday's law is really a statement about the fields. Now, this feels like a pedantic statement that I why, why am I making a fuss about this? After all, the only thing we've ever done with Faraday's law so far is we've, we've talked about it as a way of you know, inducing currents in wires. So why, who cares that I'm now telling you that it applies even if there's not a wire here? Well, this is actually very important as we're going to see much later. This generalization is actually responsible for the fact that you can see me. Because it's this generalization, it's the fact that Faraday's law becomes a statement not about wires and currents, but about electric fields and changing magnetic fields. This is responsible, this is one of the aspects of Maxwell's equations. This is now, this is the third of four Maxwell's equations. This feature of Maxwell's equations, that it's a, an equation relating an E to a time varying B, a contour integral of E around a loop to the time, the time variation of B through a surface, 
This is responsible for the fact that Maxwell's equations describe electromagnetic waves. So this is responsible for the fact that it describes radio waves, microwaves, and light as you are using to see me right now. So the second generalization that Faraday's law applies whether or not there's a loop of aluminum here is in fact incredibly important, but its importance um, will not become clear until um, quite a bit later. But I'm going to end this video by pointing out that we're now um, getting pretty close to having built up the entire structure of 802, not quite yet. If we think back to this early slide that I showed at the very, very beginning with Maxwell's equations and the Lorentz force law, you've seen the Lorentz force law now. You're quite familiar with that. In fact, I used it in the previous video when I derived this over here. Um, you've seen Gauss's law. We've seen magnetic Gauss's law. And now we have the third equation here, which is Faraday's law. And if you look carefully, this fourth one, this is Ampere's law. But uh, there's the, you, the, the, the one thing you should notice is that Ampere's law has this new term on the right-hand side, and that's the only thing that we're missing right now. So um, we're almost there in terms of building up the entire structure of 802. We have all of our equations except Ampere's law. The way we have it now is missing something, and we're going to come back to that um, a little bit further on. What we're going to do next, though, is we're going to be much more careful about this sign, and then we're going to learn how to apply Faraday's law.